Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ to our service this morning. Welcome to Olive. Just happy to have you here today with us this morning. If you're a guest, that's awesome that you found your way to our service this morning. I hope it's fulfilling for you. We're getting into the, the last Sunday in our habits series. We're discussing habits, small disciplines, big results. And last week, Pastor Jason talked about starting habits. And my takeaway from last week was when you start a habit, you want to set it up for success. And that just means making sure as you're starting it, maybe it's a small step, something like that to kind of get the ball rolling. And habits are, are a snowball. So as things get going, they, it's a lot easier to do it as, as you build that habit. Then today we're talking about stopping habits. So the inverse of that. So how do we stop a habit? I'm excited to get into that here today. As I was thinking about habits, I was thinking habits are typically the habits we want to start and we want to stop, they're part of life. And they might be big things. And who else, who else cares about our life? Well, Jesus does. And who else doesn't care about our life? And that'd be the enemy. So there's this tension when you're starting habits and stopping habits to don't start them and don't stop them. And it's a, it's a spiritual battle then that's raging in your, in your mind as you're doing that. And it's, it's kind of serious when you think about it. But not only is it serious, and that I think is one of the first things, is acknowledging, hey, this is going to be hard. This might be a battle. But the good news is we already know who, who wins. And we also have that, that trust that Jesus is going to take care of it. Today we're going to read Romans, and, and Paul talks in Romans about the law and, and then the darkness, sin. And it's this, this battle between light and dark, and that's also in 1 John. And so I wanted to read a little bit of 1 John this morning. Uh, 1 John 4 says, Loved ones, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know the Holy Spirit by this. Every spirit that acknowledges that Messiah Jesus has come in flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the anti-Messiah, which you have heard is coming and now is already in the world. You are from God, children, and you have overcome them, because great is he who is in you, than he who is in the world. I'm going to read that again. You are from God, children, and you have overcome them, because greater is he, now that's a capital H, he, greater is he who is in you, that's that promise that Jesus is with us. Greater is he, greater is he who is in you, than he, and that's a lowercase he, who is in the world. They are from the world, so they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So as we're talking about habits today and that, that tension, we know that Jesus is in us, and we win. It's, it's, it's that simple. It doesn't always seem that simple, but it really is that simple. The promise that Jesus has given us gives us the strength to fight that, that spirit of darkness around us. So let's, uh, let's open with prayer here, and then we'll continue with singing. Jesus, thank you for bringing us here this morning to you. We lift up the service to you, dedicate this time to you. Clear all the garbage from the past week, any other worries about the week ahead, and just let us focus in on what your scriptures have to say to us this morning, what the music has to say to us, what Pastor Jason has to say to us. Just, we lift this entire time to you, we dedicate this time to you, and we know that you're greater than any spirit that's in this world. And thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted high.
I love that image of the, the one little domino gets blown by just a little, a little bit of wind and then the whole thing, and then it, I can't make the noise, but it ding, 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 got all the way down and all of a sudden it just comes down with a thud. I think it works both for starting habits and for stopping habits. I just think that's a really neat, neat visual. Our scripture this morning comes from uh, a, couple, a couple books. The first one I'll start with is Judges. Judges 16, 1 through 4. And this is uh, part of the story of Samson. One day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night saying, at dawn we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faced Hebron. Some time later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And then from Romans, chapter 7. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Let's have a prayer for Pastor Jason. Lord, there's this constant struggle between light and dark, and we see that here as we read Romans just lift up Pastor Jason as he delivers his sermon to us this morning. Just may we hear what you have to say to us through him, and thank you for bringing him here with us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, praise team, for bringing us into this service so well. We want to welcome everyone again back into all of Mennonite Church online. And if you are here for the first time or for the first time in a while, uh, we are in the third and final week of this sermon series called Habits, Small Disciplines, Big Results. We again want to thank Life Church for providing these resources for us and for the teams that they have that they put together, uh, these resources for free for other churches to use. So we want to thank Life Church uh, for their their work. Um, In this series, we've been looking at the ways in which small habits direct our life in one direction or another. And like Nathan mentioned, this uh, this this uh, intro video that we have with just the small uh, small. Uh, dominoes, uh, it, it starts small and it 
builds momentum as it goes, and you can see then the big shifts, the big impacts it can make further down the line. It's not the single time that we, that we perform an action or perform a habit that, that makes an impact, that makes a difference, but it's the culmination of many times over years that impacts life. In week one, we recognize the importance of of knowing our identity and how it is our identity that is the driving force to the direction our lives can go. And once we know our identity, the actions we take, the the disciplines that we develop, the, the, the overall life systems, the habits will take shape around who we see ourselves as and who we belong to. When this area is fuzzy or uncertain, there's no rhyme or reason for why we do the things that we do. But once we know our identity, then we can see our destination. And when we see our destination or, or our goal for the end of life of who we want to become, when this comes into focus, we can see the purpose for our life and the steps that we need to take to build our lives, to to live into our purpose of getting to our final goal of of who we want to become. Last week we talked about the factor of of, uh, starting new disciplines, starting new habits to create a life system that will springboard us in the direction that we need to go. And to review, when we make a shift in, in starting a small new discipline, We need to make an obvious and easily visible cue for our discipline to start. And then when we see that cue, when we have that cue, the second thing we need to do is make our next action easy and simple. Because when we try to bite off too much at a time, it may not be impossible, but it might be too much and we can get frustrated and discouraged and then then the change that we started out to to make, it falls into yet another good intention that just stayed a good intention and never came to fulfillment. For those of us who are Jesus followers, we have our identity. We have our purpose. We know what that is, right? And now we have these tools to start new good disciplines which can turn into good habits when held fast with intentionality and purpose. Today we're going to be looking at the flip side of stopping bad habits. And we'll start with a quote from Bob Newhart from one of his counseling sessions when he's trying to get someone to work through something they're trying to stop to get through a bad habit. So here's the quote from Bob Newhart. Stop it! (laughs) It's deep stuff, right? (laughs) Just like new routines, good disciplines that turn into good habits started with knowing and paying attention to our identity and in turn understanding our destination or our purpose. And stopping old routines... And bad habits starts in the same place as we look at who we are and looking ahead to who we want to become. We identify things in our life that could be tweaked a bit or or even completely stopped and removed, eliminated. And as we go through these steps, there's going to be some similar factors in, in stopping bad habits as there was in starting new habits. Bad habits likely have a cue or a trigger. You may not intend to do these things. In fact, you may have even told yourself that you would never do X or Y or Z again. I did it for the last time. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that again. Then a cue comes in front of you. And a cue for a bad habit could be something as simple as, as boredom, anger, stress, failure, Isolation, loneliness, which we have a lot of right now. It may not be, a cue for a bad habit may not be a specific event like, like is helpful maybe with starting good habits. 
But for whatever reason, we don't plan to, uh, to keep going back and doing the things we want to do. We, do, we heard this again uh, in this Romans 7 passage this morning. But the cue hits, and we fall back into the old routines with the reward that, that tries to fill a hole, but, but if we're honest, it leaves us wanting more. Let's take a look at Samson today. If you're, on, if you're on our emails to receive the scripture for Sunday, you saw that I gave you the whole passage of Samson for, for Judges 13 to 16. And sometime we might, we might work through that whole story because uh, there's a whole lot of good stuff for, there, uh, for us to learn. But, but for today, it's good to be familiar with the whole story, but we're going to focus on this little section in Judges 16. And this isn't the, 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 the first, this isn't the first bad decision Samson made, but, but it falls in a long line like these dominoes falling. It falls in a long line of decisions that Samson made throughout his life that drove him from one bad decision to the next. And we can say, well, it's obvious that he shouldn't have done that. It's obvious his life was a mess. I wouldn't do that. And we can sum up his life with something like, Samson was a wayward soul who fell into the wrong crowd and was tortured throughout his life from his bad decisions. Actually, we can probably all think of someone like this right now, can't we? Or maybe we feel like that sums us up. But that would be too easy to explain life away in this manner. Let's take a closer look at this passage and Samson's options along the way. Samson, as we know, was chosen by God as a Nazarite, which was one of the reasons he had the long hair. If you were chosen to be a Nazarite, it meant uh, being a Nazarite meant you were in God's service. You were working for God, and the long hair was uh, a, a significant uh, identifier for people in the Israelite community to see who these people were. That, were, uh, that this person had been called, had been set apart to do a specific purpose for God. And so he had the long hair and he wasn't supposed to cut it. But he was chosen by God to be a judge for the Israelites and to deliver them from the Philistines who had been picking on the Israelites for some time now. And Samson seemed to use the old adage of keep your friends close and your enemies closer, except he forgot the friends part. He seemed to really like hanging out with the Philistines, the people he was trying to, was there to deliver the Israelites from. And the, the Philistines, in turn, pestered him throughout his life history. And he tried to marry them. He tried to make friends with them. And they would seemingly let him into their circle on one hand, but on the other hand, they would, they would keep him out. And this just bugged him. And this, in this passage, Samson goes from, from what we think was probably his hometown in, in, in uh, Manah Dan, and he travels to Gaza, which is about a 25-mile trip. And he goes to Gaza to meet a prostitute. And so we have this in verses 1 through 3, and then verse 4, we don't know how much time passes there, but from same chapter, verses 1 through 3, he's going to meet a prostitute. In verse 4, he falls in love with Delilah. We don't know how much time there. So you can see how his life, the decisions that he made, there wasn't really a rhyme or reason for it. So he goes to Gaza to meet a prostitute. And now I don't know about you, but I've never traveled 25 miles on foot. I've ran a half marathon once in a little under two hours, and let me tell you, there is a lot of alone time, alone in your thoughts time, when you're going that far, and that was like 13 miles or something like that. 25 miles over rugged terrain on a dirt path, you have a lot of time, thought time, to process what you're doing. But Samson traveled these 25 miles to go and see this prostitute. And it's not like he was in a car or a train. He was on foot, on this dirt path through rugged terrain. 
And Craig Rochelle did the math on this one for us. It would have taken Samson around 56,250 steps to get to Gaza. And each step, each step is an opportunity for Samson to go in a different direction. I also want to note, like we said last week, the further down the path you go, the harder it is to turn around. The same is true when we're heading in the right direction for the right purpose. The further you go in that direction, the more dominoes that fall pushing you in that direction, the more the momentum builds and the easier it is to keep going, even when it gets difficult. But bad habits, bad disciplines, it's the same thing. And Samson had 56,250 opportunities to take a step in a different direction. And we have the same opportunities with our lives as well. God has a path for us. Every step we take, every bite that we take, every hour sitting on the couch, every whatever it might be, is a new opportunity to shift and move in a new direction. Here's a big problem though. There's no one as good at talking you into something. There's no one as good at talking you into something negative or out of something positive. There's no one as good at making you think that something isn't that big of a deal. It's not going to hurt anything or anyone. There's no one as good at justifying something than the person in the mirror. Of all the outside influences we have, there's no one as good at making your decision to take a step in the direction of what, of what feels good for me now, of what relieves stress or anger or, or gives an instant reward. There's no one as good at justifying our direction as the person in the mirror. And the same is true when we move in the right direction. That builds our future. But if we're honest with ourselves, if, if we have to justify the steps that we take, if we have to, to make excuses for why we didn't do something right and, and left it for someone else to do, if we blindly justify and make these excuses, we, we move past our future selves for what's good for me in the here and now. And, for, and those justifications and those excuses are, are a good flag for us to realize that whatever that next step may be that I'm trying to justify or trying to make an excuse for is probably a red flag that that's maybe not a good step. That's, that's maybe not the right direction. See, when something's good for me now but not good for me in the future. We argue with ourselves, right? We debate with ourselves. Ah, oh, you know, it's not really, it's not that big of a deal. And we make justifications for why it's okay. But when we know something is right, it's simply that. It's just right. You don't have to talk yourself into it. You don't have to talk yourself out of it. It just is the right Thing. So if you're justifying something, maybe over and over and over again, make that your cue to take a step in a different direction. Here's something Andrea and I did a few years back when we noticed that uh, our TV consumption was higher than, uh, than what we would have liked. And I don't know what the national average for TV watching is, and, and that doesn't matter. It was, it was more than what we knew we should be watching. <clears throat> and we noticed that we had a propensity for, for sitting down in the evenings after uh, a long day at work, 
uh, we, we put Piper to bed and, and we sit down on the couch and we're tired and the remote's right there and we turn it on and we'll just, we'll just watch one show. <laughs> and then one show turns into several shows and before we know it, we watched way too much TV. We both knew that this wasn't, this wasn't a great setup for us as a family and, and we came up with a solution. We removed the TV. It wasn't football season anymore, and so it was a little bit easier <laughs> during that stage. So we removed the TV, and we put it in the basement uh, for the summer. And then when football season started, we, we brought it back up on Sundays, and we watched football, and then we put it back down in the basement during the week. And now our TV is back in our room full time. <laughs> but we had a cue for being... For being tired in the evening and the ease of, of TV usage that led to a habit that included way too much TV. And so we made it difficult to watch TV. We made it difficult for TV watching to happen. And you can see this is just the opposite of starting a new, a, a, a new good habit where we wanted to make an easily visible cue and make whatever it is we're trying to start make it easy and simple. This is just the opposite. So we removed the TV and we made it hard to watch. And then we each had books that we were working on. So we left our books on the couch. <clears throat> Excuse me. The books were easily accessible. And when we, we weren't reading our books, we were having conversations with each other that, that, that likely wouldn't have happened if we were sitting in front of the TV. Conversations with your spouse are a wonderful, wonderful thing. So to stop a bad habit, we need to make it difficult. We need to be attentive to the cues that, that point us in the direction of that bad habit. And we need to make it difficult to move in that direction. Cut up your credit cards. And only take cash with you when you, when you go to Target or Kohl's or, or wherever your, your spot might be. Or remove your card from, from your Amazon account so every time you make a purchase you have to enter it in again and it makes it just a little bit more difficult. Don't buy the sweet treat that we'll only have at that special occasion this time. But we know that We'll all too easily eat it before the special occasion ever comes. <laughs> Have problems with, with social media or web browsing? Use your app limitations and, and the, the tools on your phone. Use your apps to help, to help uh, keep you from using your apps. I just recently started using my iPhone, uh, using this as my iPhone about a year ago started showing me how much I was on my phone each day. And that each Sunday morning I get a report about whether I'm, my percentage was up or down from the week before. Some of, you are, some of you get these little notifications. And for a little while, this was enough. This was motivation for me. Because when that first one came up, I was like, whoa. <laughs> and so I... I reduced the amount I was on my phone. But it's still not enough. And so just recently I started putting the limits on, on specific apps. I limit Instagram to 15 minutes a day and Facebook to 30 minutes a day. Because I, I use Facebook for work a little bit, so I need a little bit of play there to have it. But, but it still limits me to 30 minutes a day. And once I reached those limits, uh, Andrea reminded me that I could just load them in Safari, which is the, the app on the iPhone, and look at them there. And so, so now I limit Safari as well to 20 minutes a day, which gives me plenty of time to look up a restaurant or, or other things that I might need. Or if I need a little more Instagram time, I can get it. But then Safari shuts off too. Use the tools around you to help cut out these bad habits. The tools are there. And typically, they're, they're not that hard to use. But like we said, with starting a habit, we have to be diligent and purposeful in creating new paths 
that push us away from the old habits. And remember, when, when something is a habit, and we have that cue that leads us into that habit, our brains hardly have to work at all to motivate, to push our body in that direction. So if we're going to leave something behind, and for those of us who are Jesus followers especially, if we're moving in this direction, we must be intentional and diligent and remember our purpose of living for Him. And if you can't make these changes on your own, to borrow from the old game, of, uh, the old game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Use your lifelines. Ask for help. Call a friend. Use a 50-50. Cut your options in half. Ask the audience. They can let you know if something's a good idea or not. Ask them, is this, is this something I should be doing? Or lean on that trusted friend to help you. Give them a call. If that's not enough, get professional help. Get counseling. Financial planning and counseling from, from someone like Dave Ramsey or, or a local financial planner. Personal counseling from a, a professional, not your best friend that's really good at helping you dig holes, but from somewhat from a professional. Marriage counseling from a good Christian marriage counselor. Use one of your friends like an accountability partner. I have a couple of these for, for my well-being goals that I make each year. Andrea is one of them and my friend Scott is the other. They check in with me periodically and even participate in some ways with me to help me achieve my goals and to make changes in my life so that my future will be better. I know each one of us wants to leave old things behind. But we deceive ourselves in thinking that, that we, can get what, we can get to whatever it might be, or we can get whatever it might be that we're having a problem with, we can get it under control on our own. But we need to let go of our pride. And we need to let others in and let others help us. Bring Jesus in on this. Through prayer and petition, present your request to God. We all know that passage, right? We aren't hiding anything from Him anyway. Bring Him in and let Him into your struggles. Lay these old habits, habits that if we're honest, we hate and our burdens and lay them at the feet of Jesus. And look around to see who He might be putting in your path that can help you walk in His direction. As we look at where life has us, for some of us it might just be small sections of our life that, that we don't know how, how, how or what to do with or how we got to where we are. And for others of us it might, it might be a whole bunch of things that the sum of our life has taken us to places we never intended to go. We got there one small decision at a time. And it's not the one time, but it's the sum of all of these little decisions that add up to get to where we're going. And if we're honest, if we're, if we're really honest with ourselves, no one else got us there. Sure, we can, we can try to pass blame somewhere else. Or try to explain how, how much life has dealt me. How much life has dealt us. We can justify why we made decisions or, or how we got to where we are. And they're different for every one of us. But you know the area in your life that this hits. But if we're really truly honest with ourselves there's no one who's talked you into bad decisions except for the person in the mirror we've got to remember the same is true for our good decisions too yeah we have influences that that nudge us one way or another we do we have influences but at the end of the day the choices we make they're not forced upon us. 
They're ours to make. It's our choice and the decisions that we make, even if just for, if, if it's not, we know what our end goal is, but, but the decisions that we make, even just for that moment that you made the decision, the decisions we make strip back all the fluff and show us what's important. The decisions that we make show us what our priorities are, even if in just for those moments. <clears throat> what are your decisions telling you? What are your life systems telling you? What are your priorities? Are your priorities living in, in what feels good for me now? Or are your priorities bigger than me, bigger than us, bigger than you, bigger than the here and now and guiding me to a better future? What's the legacy that your priorities will leave behind? Is it a legacy of, of love or a legacy of pain? The wise King Solomon says in, in Proverbs 27, 12, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. To be prudent is, is to be crafty or shrewd and sensible. Today's decisions show up in tomorrow's outcomes and relationships. Today's decisions smuggle themselves into our future selves into our future outcomes. And the prudent make decisions by responding based on where they want to be, not based on what I want now, based on their end goals. And if you're a Jesus follower, our goal is to leave behind the legacy of Jesus' love in our path. King Solomon also said at the end of this passage that the simple approach life and they they just keep going as if life is disconnected. They don't think to, to stop about it. They don't, they don't stop and think about it. They just, they just keep going. There's no rhyme or reason to the choices they make. Whatever's good for me now is what I'm going to do. Or if they do, they, they ignore the future because the penalty or the impact seems like it's so far off in the distance that it's, it's not really that big of a deal. I'll make a different decision next time. But then the, the, simple, the simple look around and they realize that after years of, of unfocused, unpurposeful, unintentional actions, they led them to a life that is a wreck. We don't start out intending to wreck our lives. And we typically don't do it in, in one action. We don't wreck them all at once. It's a pile of life of a lifetime of regrets and wishing we had done some things differently. Look back at Samson. If you aren't familiar with his story, I encourage you to I encourage you to 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 go back and read it, Judges 13 to 16. His life isn't the one of a hero of the Bible that I remember as a child. Samson was one of my favorite childhood heroes because, it's like Nathan read this morning, he lifted the whole gate of the city and carried it up a hill. I mean, how awesome is that? He pushed the pillars of the temple down to destroy the Philippines. A hero, right? Man, his life was a mess. His life is, isn't full of God's strength or isn't full of, <laughs> isn't full of life pointing others to God. His life is full of repercussions of, of an explosive temper and thinking he was above it all because he knew he was chosen. He knew he was special. He knew he was stronger and smarter than everybody else tried to use that to his advantage 
And he paid a great price for it. But here's another thing that we can learn from Samson. As messed up as his life was, it is never too late to call on God and to recognize His path for your life. Yeah, the longer you wait to step onto His path, the harder and more painful and more intense that step might be. But you can be certain of this. Whether you're a child or a teenager or a young adult or, or a middle adult or an adult nearing the end of life, God sent His Son, Jesus, to pay the price of taking that step and leaving the old behind. Sure, we might have some earthly consequences. But we have an eternal, already paid for path laid down through the life of Jesus Christ. And it's only in believing in, in who He is and what He did for us that we can get to heaven for in eternity. Like the prophet Zechariah said, we mentioned this passage last week, the Lord rejoices when we start the small work. Start now. Start now. Yes, He rejoices when we accomplish the big goals. He certainly does. But I think He sings a great song of joy when we, when we simply make a shift and start with the small work. With the little things of, of building blocks, of laying our dominoes out. And laying these blocks on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. You are not your failures. You are created by God. You are loved by God. And our God has a purpose for you. Our God wants so much more for you than, than where you feel like you're stuck. He wants so much more for us than getting stuck in our failures and letting our failures be our identity. He doesn't want us to be stuck in our bad habits and feeling like like we're on our own to get out of it. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He is your purpose, and His purpose is for you, is for me, is for us to live into His calling for our lives. The specifics might be revealed in the long term as we continue on that journey, but right now, right now, just start. Just start because He rejoices when we start with the small things. The small things that that line up with His purpose for for all our lives. How does your life system, the routines, the habits in your life, how do they line up with God's purpose? How do they line up with, with who you want to become? If we're off course, we must be intentional. We must fill our lives with simple and purposeful actions of living out a life in a way that brings the love of Christ into those around us. I invite the praise team forward. When you make it about loving Christ and loving others, we fall in line with His purpose. We've heard this a lot. You'll hear it all throughout the whole New Testament. He has a brand new commandment. And that is loving others. You can't can't go wrong when you're loving others. May the systems, the good disciplines, the, the cues, 
and the habits in our lives lead us in this way. Whether you are starting new habits or breaking old ones, don't go it alone. Bring others in on this journey with you. Use the tools around you to help, to help push you in, this, in, in the direction towards Christ. And those people around you right now, they want you to get on the same path that they're on in living and loving for Jesus Christ. And when we walk together, when we walk together with the purpose of living in His love, it's a beautiful thing. Join us as we sing our praises and fill our hearts with His love. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met.
Good habits are hard. They're usually hard or hurt right now for a bit. But they're good for us in the future. Bad habits are easy. They're easy to do right now. They feel good right now, but the future impact hurts. Don't tie your identity to what you do, but tie it to who you want to become. Tying your identity to what you do or what you've done is a case of mistaken identity. You are not your actions. Yes, we're responsible for them, and there are rewards and consequences, but but they do not define you. Your Creator defines you. Your Creator defines you as love. And He's calling your name. He's calling you out of the grave, out of your failures, out of that that dark grave into His glorious name. And when we sink into His name, we are made brand new and our failures and our past hold us no more. Take His love. And may your life be on full display of the power of love at work in you. As you create new systems, create good disciplines and that become Jesus-centered habits. Amen.